Hi everyone, my name is Megan Ward and I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about the results of my undergraduate thesis at Trent University and that project is entitled Do Existing Constructed Ponds on Pelee Island, Ontario Match the Habitat Requirements of Endangered and Vistima Larvae? So for this project, I worked in collaboration with Dr. Tom Hosey, and it was recently accepted to wetlands. So I've included the citation there if anyone is interested in reading that paper. And it's actually my very first published paper, so it is quite exciting. As many of us probably know, we've seen a loss of wetlands on a global scale. And unfortunately, Canada is no different. Huge levels of wetland loss have been experienced across Canada, and that loss is ongoing. Southern Ontario specifically has experienced tremendous wetland loss. As you can see in the figure on the slide, the southern tip of Ontario has experienced an almost 100% loss of wetlands. And this started in the early 1800s and is continuing until, until today. And it really is in that loss of wetlands that the story I will be telling today starts. So our study took place on Pelee Island, which is Canada's most southerly island, and is bordered by Lake Erie. So in the mid 1880s, almost 50% of the wetland on Pelee Island was drained and converted into agricultural fields. Since then, even more of the remaining wetland has been developed into residential land, including both seasonal and year round housing. As a result of this historic and unfortunately ongoing wetland loss, the amphibian populations on the island have declined, specifically the unique unisexual ambistema complex found on the island. Now there are three species of ambistema that live on the island, the blue spotted salamander, the small mouse salamander, and the unisexual salamander. Pelee Island is the only location in Canada where the small mouse salamander can be found, and because of the extensive habitat loss, it is listed as endangered according to Kosiewicz. However, it isn't all bad news on Pelee. As a result of the loss of habitat, various stakeholders on the island have committed to creating constructed ponds in order to increase the breeding habitat available to the amphibians on Pelee, with specific consideration given to the salamanders on Pelee. However, as you can see in the figures on the slide, the naturally occurring ponds, meaning they haven't been created by humans on the left, appear to have very different environmental characteristics than the man-made constructed ponds on the right, because of these observed differences, we wanted to know if the constructed ponds on the island met the habitat requirements of the Ambistema larvae. So in the summer of 2019, we spent about two weeks collecting a ton of data, focusing on specific habitat traits, including things like canopy cover, pond depth, substrate, pond temperature, pond surface area, proximity to a forest, etc., along with a measurement of presence and abundance of salamander larvae. And we actually had some pretty interesting results. So we first want to see what habitat variables impacted larvae presence. After identifying potentially correlated variables, so that was canopy cover and substrate, we used a model selection approach to compare logistic regression models, and we had three main variables catch our attention. Crayfish burrow presence was seen to have a pretty strong relationship to the presence of larvae. Now, this may just be that the chimney crayfish on the island enjoy the same habitat as in Mr. Malarvae. However, we did observe adult salamanders using abandoned crayfish tunnels or chimneys, as they're sometimes referred to as, as sites of refugia during our sampling. And you can see what that chimney looks like in an image there on the slide. So it may be that adult salamanders are more apt to breed in sites that provide this type of refugia. We found that canopy cover increased as the probability of larvae presence increased. There are a few non-mutually exclusive mechanisms that may explain this. First, increased canopy cover might serve to moderate temperature fluctuations in pond water, and it may serve to lower average pond water temperature, both of which have been found to benefit developing larvae. And when we tested this, we actually did see a modest but still present negative relationship between canopy cover and noon corrected water temperature. Secondly, we know that adult salamanders can migrate an average of 125 meters during the breeding season. However, they can often be found living closer to their breeding ponds. In fact, Parmalee 1993 found that small mouse salamanders lived within 60 meters of their breeding ponds. And at a few known breeding ponds on Pelee, we found that adult salamanders live less than 20 meters away. 
If the perimeter of the pond has a high canopy cover, it may increase pond suitability by providing shelter for migrating adults and emerging juveniles. Finally, a dense canopy cover of deciduous trees may improve pond substrate by increasing the abundance of fallen leaf litter on the pond floor and provide refugia against predators and conspecifics. And finally, the probability of larvae presence increased with leaf litter in the substrate, which was rated on a scale of zero to two, zero being no leaf litter in the substrate and two representing the entire floor of the pond being covered in leaf litter. Interestingly, not all the same variables that impacted larvae presence also impact larvae abundance or catch per unit effort. We assessed abundance using a systematic dip net approach of 80 sweeps per pond and used a similar series of logistic regression models to assess the variables impacting abundance. Similar to presence, leaf litter in the substrate increased as larvae abundance increased. However, we also found that submergent vegetation was almost always present in ponds that had high levels of abundance. Ponds with abundant leaf litter and submergent vegetation should possess a greater abundance of prey for salamander larvae, allowing a larger number of larvae to survive in the pond. These species of ambistoma have been observed to be cannibalistic for words conspecifics, so increasing refugia from that threat while increasing habitat for prey species, namely small invertebrate, aquatic invertebrates and sometimes detritus, can increase the abundance of larvae in a pond. So now that we figured out what variables were meant were important to the occupancy of breeding ponds, we could try and figure out if the constructed ponds supported these traits. We conducted a principal component analysis, and after using a MANOVA and subsequent ANOVA, found that PC1 represented significant differences between natural and constructed ponds. And you can see on the side there, high PC1 values represent high canopy cover, more leaf litter, presence of submergent vegetation, cooler temperatures, almost all of which were significant variables in determining larvae presence and or abundance. And we can see that natural ponds have higher PC1 values, and on average, the constructed ponds had lower PC1 values, meaning the constructed ponds do not provide habitat necessary for larvae presence and or abundance. So in summary, this slide is just telling us that no, unfortunately, the constructed ponds on Pili do not match the habitat requirements of breeding abyssinal larvae. So what does all of this mean? At the end of this day, we're using the study to caution against the assumption that the creation of constructed ponds will functionally replace established or natural wetlands at least right away. While there is the chance the constructed wetlands will improve in suitability over time, and in fact, we do see examples of this on the island, we want to warn against the assumption that the loss of natural ponds will be immediately offset by the creation of constructed ponds, as they often lack the variables needed to create suitable habitat for ambistoma breeding. That being said, we did propose a few tips and tricks to increase the suitability of constructed ponds, both over long and short timeframes. The design of wetlands must be done carefully. They should be located in areas within dispersal distance of already colonized ponds, Amphibians, including salamanders, have a really high site fidelity, meaning if an amphibian is born in pond A, it will return to pond A to breed. This life history characteristics makes the colonization process difficult and it can take upwards of five to 10 years before a pond is successfully colonized. As well, the pond should be supported by restoration efforts over a suitable period of time to ensure that the habitat is actually improving. So with that being said, I want to thank you for listening to my presentation and a special thanks to everyone on the slide who made it possible for us to conduct the research. If you have any questions or would like to learn more, please send me an email at meganward.trentu.ca. Thank you and have a nice day.